saw the video segment about Trent Sportswear, and it talked about how they segment their market. First, let's talk about some of the different ways that we said we could segment a market. What are some of the key ways that we said we could segment a market? Remember we said segmenting is about dividing a market into sub-markets, or aggregating a group of potential customers together that have similar needs and wants, that respond to the marketing mix in a similar way, and are reachable. And so what are some of the ways that we could segment the market? Go ahead. So we could do it uh, demographically, based on our age, gender, uh, maybe religion, other things like that, or we could do it, let's say, what do we call it, psychologically? Psychographic. Psychographic, sorry. Yeah, and that, that So what's psychographic? What is that? Um, that's uh, by lifestyle, by the choices of like, people go through every day. So this would be a psychographic market, because it's a lifestyle thing, people play tennis. All right, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. What else? So we have demographic, psychographic. Behavioral, which would include usage rate. usage rate would be a good example of behavioral. So they're a light user, a moderate user, a heavy user, which is important for us to know. Go ahead. Of geographic. Geographic. People, so, if you live in certain regions, will have similar interests. Right. And there's a lot of different ways that you could segment a market or a category. Let's think about the way that Prince segmented the market. Go ahead. Um, they did one demographically. They had three different lines for a very advanced player, a more conventional casual player, and for children. So they did that by age. Too. And so they, um, they named those segments. What do they call them? Because once you segment the market, um, we name the segments. And remember, this is something usually that's internal, although sometimes our segmentation is something that um, translates, obviously, into our branding or um, our product strategy. But we could have, you know, we have internal names for our um, products. What are, what are the segments that they've identified? How do they name them? Go ahead. They, they gave, the first one I think was something like professional? Perform uh, performance. Performance. And they have recreational and junior. And this is specifically for tennis? Yeah. So for tennis, the tennis market, there's a lot of different ways that we could look at the, the tennis market. And they segmented the market <coughs> based on these classifications. What, is, what do these mean? What's the difference between those segments, and why is it relevant? Um, well, I wanted to say that the, the last segment, the junior segment, could you say that it's more beginner segment, not junior segment? That there are, that there are, yes, yes no. That it's not specifically towards a kid. It's towards a smaller racket. It's 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 a middle one. Well, the middle one is there's other the ways that we could segment the market. We're just trying to identify the way they segmented the market. So definitely we could come up with different approaches. Absolutely. But um, for us, in terms of a takeaway, what we want to do is understand the way they um, segmented it. But I agree. There's other ways definitely we could look at it. Go ahead. Um, I believe the, the, the way that they marketed was the performance was for more um, professional players. People are going to play more competitively. Recreational is if you want to casually play. Um, and the junior, like they showed in the, uh, in the video segment, um, is for younger players that are beginning, that are, are younger and smaller. So it has to do with they segmented the market based on skill? Yeah, yeah. skill. Yeah. Yeah. So skill, the level of skill. Skill and, skill and frequency of use. And also, and also and comfortable, like comfortable. Okay, so that's another interesting um, um, component is and that the your level of skill <coughs> and also how often that you play. Your comfort. Comfort as far as, far as what you're looking for in the racket. Right, so now that we segmented the market this way, so then how does that translate into their product? So in other words, we said that some um, have a very high level of skill, some have a very low level of skill. How did they modify 
their product. Because remember, we're saying that this segment is large and they have similar needs and wants and they're going to respond to the marketing mix in a similar way and they're reachable. What do we do about that? So are we going to sell the same racket to each of these segments or is the benefit of segmenting the market this way so that we could tailor and customize the racket for each of these segments? Go ahead, Zach. I mean, big benefit uh, Somebody who's going to go to Walmart to buy a tennis racket, they're not going to go there. To, like a performance racket, you can also assume it's more expensive than a recreational racket. So like no one's going to go to a Walmart to buy a $500 tennis racket than they would to buy a $50 one. So it has a lot to do with like more than just the amount you buy. So the level of skill <coughs> is significant, and in terms of product, what Zach is saying is that this racket is going to be very expensive, and then the rackets that they're going to sell, for example, um, to the junior segment is going to be basically inexpensive, certainly inexpensive relative to what they charge for performance. And Jack also took <coughs> us um, another step, which has to do with where you distribute the product. So he said, some products are distributed at Walmart, and Walmart is known as an everyday low price retailer, EDLP, but then Zach pointed out that these rackets, you're not going to be able to buy there. Do you guys agree? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So that it has an impact, the way we segment through the market has an impact on the price for the product, where we distribute the product. So what, is, what are those two things that we just mentioned as it relates to the marketing mix? Product. Price, place. And what about the product? How does the product change? Go ahead. They make considerable changes that maybe the ones that are <coughs> more professional, the, the changes are relevant for them, but those changes they are not necessarily relevant for the casual users. <coughs> so like the amount that the uh, racket vibrates or stuff like that. So how did they improve the performance? What's the difference between um, this racket, the performance um, racket, and the, the junior racket. <coughs> they made it more specific. They said that they increased the, the sweet spot size by 83%, which has a better return on the energy. So someone who's more skillful and they know how to play, someone who's less skillful and they, know how to, they don't know how to play as well, the racket will perform just as well anyways. But the performance ones are more specific. You know how to use them better in like a tailored fashion to play to a higher level. So there's um, features that the racket has mm -hmm that somebody with more skill is going to be able to utilize. Yeah. Yeah. But the rackets that they're um, trying to sell to the junior segment, it doesn't have those features, or it does? So it's easier to use. Yeah, so it's more simple, but the things that are like maybe a junior wouldn't be able to use the performance racket because it's more specific. But if you know how to use it, it's a better tool. So they've definitely, they've definitely modified the product in that way. Anything else? What else did they, how else did they modify the product? Size. Size. So that's important. So they definitely, they've identified these segments and now we're talking about the different ways that they tailored the product. What else? So the size of the product we said. Um, what else? What else is it about the product that's different? So it's not one size fits all. Is that right? Or they're trying to sell a standardized product to each one of these segments? No. No to which question? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not a standardized. It's not standardized. So the 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 segmentation of the market was not an academic exercise for them. It's not just interesting. They segmented the market and identified these segments that have similar needs and wants, and then they developed products to specifically meet the needs of each of those segments. Is that right? Yeah. And it means that they changed the size of the product, they changed the price of the product, the design of the product, the features of the product. Mm -hmm. So 
it has implications. It's not just that you segment the market and that's it. You segment the market for a reason so that you could identify segments and maximize the sales of the company. Because each one of those segments, right, we said that we tailor the product for each one of those segments. And each one of them is large and reachable. And that means that we're going to be able to sell more rackets because we also understand, as Zach was saying, that we're not going to just try and sell all our rackets in Walmart, although Walmart is the world's largest retailer. But we have to know where is the best place to sell our product. And if we have multiple product lines, then very often we're going to sell in different channels of distribution. So we might sell in um, discount stores. We're also going to sell in sporting goods stores. In some cases, we might sell in department stores. You might even find maybe these um, junior rackets, you might even find them in convenience stores. Um, in some cases, you might find um, these products in wholesale clubs. But certainly, there's got to be an alignment between our price and the channel in which we sell the product. So, this is an example, and I think this is a good example of in pricing what we call good, better, best pricing. So you see why it's just not um, academic what they did, that it has significant implications. And so they have an inexpensive racket, a moderately priced racket, and also an expensive racket, which they're trying to sell to professional athletes. Now, how does that impact our advertising? Are we going to be able to use the same commercials or print ads for all of these segments, or is there something we have to change? Go ahead. Yeah, the segments are very helpful because they help us identify our market in the sense that we know that uh, people people looking for a recreation uh, for a performance racket would probably go to a store that's more tailored just to sports. So they would probably go to a sporting goods store, or like they said in the video, a place that specifically is a tennis shop where people go go there to get a tennis product. So it's helpful because it helps tailor what the customer is looking for. Absolutely, that's a very good point. And then take it the next step now in terms of advertising. How is that going to impact our approach to advertising and the, um, the different media that we might use and the messaging? What do you think, Alan? Maybe the recreational one, you can advertise it in like social network and stuff like that. And the performance, you can advertise it in tennis courts when the more professional and frequent players play, and the junior ones maybe toy stores or something like that. So, um, yeah, so outdoor advertising, as you're suggesting, you might have a, a billboard um, at tennis events where you could reach tennis players, but also um, definitely um, people who are tennis enthusiasts or aspiring um, professional tennis players. Do you think that's, that's significant? Or the only people who buy the performance rackets are those that are professional athletes? What do you no. think? Oh, there's a lot. Yeah, people who are just like me, I guess, I could get sucked into uh, buying a $500 racket just as easily as anyone else. It's a matter of pro promoting it the right way. And so what is it, um, what is part of the expectation when you buy a product like this, or later on we're going to look at um, a, um, a golfing glove. Are you guys familiar with this golfing glo glove called Greptile? What is it? What is it about the Greptile glove, or this um, performance racket, or um, Air Jordan sneakers? <laughs> what is the expectation? Go ahead, tell us. Well, it kind of seems like um, it's worse than middle and best. So even though that's not exactly what it is, it's supposed to be for different people, but the expectation is that the professional one will be the best one. So if some, even though someone's not at that level, they might say, oh, this is the best, I'll, I'll get this one. So it is a high perceived value. But um, when we talk about 
quality, there's got to be perceived quality and performance quality. Do you guys see the difference? What's, who could tell us the difference? And then we're going to come back to that. Go ahead. I think for a company like, like Jordan, Air Jordan sneakers, the sneakers that you can get that are replicas or they're cheaper, they're made cheaper but still from Nike, still from Air Jordan. Um, those really allow the company, the sales from those, I think, allow the company to be able to finance the, the making of the more expensive shoe, um, where they really, uh, where they really uh, show the performance advancements they've put into it and, and any type of research that has gone into making a better uh, Jordan basketball sneaker is displayed in that in that model, whereas in the cheaper model, they've tried to emulate the look of the more expensive model so that people feel like they're getting it, but know that they're unable to afford the real thing, but there's more sales of cheaper products than there are of the higher priced performance products. In terms of the number of units? Yeah. Anybody want to add to that? So, there's two separate points um, that we need to address here. One has to do with the expectations when you use this product. And that's related to performance. And that performance is a, um, a component of quality. So what I was suggesting is that when we talk about quality, we have to look at performance and also perception. Both are very important, and it suggests that there needs to be a way for us to substantiate our claims. Now, as it relates to these types of products, generally there's an expectation of performance, that using these products are going to enable you to be a better athlete, that it's going to give you some type of edge, and there's even a suggestion, whether it's um, subliminal or maybe it's us that think subconsciously that if we're wearing a pair of Air Jordans, that we're going to be able to jump higher. What do you think? Do you think people expect that? I mean, what does it mean for a product to be a performance athletic product? So these are, um, especially with Nike products, the, the way the product is marketed is that these are the sneakers or the footwear that athletes use. And they um, historically, over the last several decades, have used celebrity endorsement as a way of building their empire. And so, the suggestion is that these athletes use our footwear. They wear our footwear. And that that's the reason why they can excel in the sport. Do you get that sense from the advertising and the marketing that just as, um, as consumers, have you gotten that sense in terms of the expectation that um, they're not coming out directly and saying that, well, that's all, you know, once you wear these sneakers, that's it. You know, you're going to be able to do the alley-oop and, uh, <laughs> right, you're just, that's it. You're going to three-point shots all the way, right? 30 points a game. Can you believe it? The Knicks won on Friday? That's unbelievable. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, when I first started watching them, Patrick Ewing was on their team. You, you guys remember Patrick Ewing? Really? Yeah. 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 Wow. He wasn't good, you know. I don't know what it was. It was too tall, but I don't know. It's most of the time the, the shots wouldn't go in. But um, that's why they would always foul him. That was part of their strategy. But anyway, go ahead. Is subliminal messaging uh, illegal? Is it? No, no. It's not illegal. Not. People would take it. Well, it, uh, unethical. It could be unethical, but you have to ask yourself if it's um, even effective. 
Like is subliminal messaging, is that something that we believe is um, really having an impact on people and what is the nature of the messaging? So in other words, if you're in a movie theater and um, before the show begins, they have some um, previews and so forth and every uh, one second they flash up the um, Pepsi logo and it happens like so quick that really, I mean, it's not something that um, that you are aware of that you might consider that to be subliminal, right? That it happens so quick and then again it happens and but it's not up there long enough so that um, that you're conscious of the of the message or seeing the logo. So, yeah, your point is a good one. I mean, is that um, okay? Is that something unethical? Um, you know, if it um, depends what the what the messaging is. You know, if it's something that could be harmful to others. Um, what do you think about um, product placement? Is that something that you consider to be subliminal? What's product placement? Where you put your product? <laughs> who you're who, who you're marketing to? As far as where, you're, like, where your ads are, on Facebook or something, or something else? Well, that's well. Um, one way I, I can see what you're saying. Sometimes we use the term that way when we talk about product placement. Or which part of the store it's in? That's also um, part of it. But there's um, a strategy that marketers use. Um, so you're right, and sometimes some terms they are interchangeably, but I was thinking of something else. Um, I read that they place products in a store um, like proportionally to where the people will be. So like this, the best, most expensive cereals will be lower down because the little kids see it on their eye level. And like the average per, like adult height, that's where they place the most expensive mouthwash because that's where they'll see it in their eyes. And the cheaper brands, <coughs> like the off-brand names like Giant or CVS, for the very bottom, because they're much cheaper. And it's the same exact mouthwash. Yeah, so placement on the shelf is definitely um, important. Is it at eye level, um, for example? Or is it at the, um, the bottom? And children will influence the decision-making process, whether or not to buy that particular cereal. And the location in the store is also significant. So is it, um, are we going to have an end cap, which is at the end of an aisle, you have a big display. That's considered to be prime real estate in a store, and um, brands compete over that space because you have a lot of visibility and it um, stimulates a significant amount of impulse purchase. But what about um, when you have, let's say, a TV show or a movie, and the star um, or the key um, actor or actress? in the movie or the show, reaches for something to drink, and they pick up a bottle of Pepsi. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody's watching, and you see that Pepsi logo? That's what we refer to um, also as product placement. And the companies have to pay for that, because they could have reached and picked up um, a bottle of Coke, or some other um, branded product. Yeah, or orange juice, right, absolutely. <laughs> orange juice, like that, there we go. What's that, orange juice? Is somebody drinking orange juice? What is that? Oh yeah, probably can. Let's see, let's see, bring it up, bring it up. Let's see this, let's check it out. <laughs> you see, that was a subliminal message. Did you see this? I you see? To, I How many um, <laughs> grapefruit juice? Oh, he tried to trick us. But look, you see the, um, that's interesting. It looks like an orange on there. So now I have to start changing that's my, a, um, my mantra now to grapefruit juice. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. But um, no, orange juice. You think that's better? Yeah, yeah orange juice makes. But um, yeah, a while back, remember we were talking a little bit also about somebody I think mentioned this about the fact that they had changed their packaging. Yeah, yeah. And um, the customers were very upset by that because of packaging, and we're going to talk about this is an important brand identity element and is part of what we call trade dress, something that's recognizable and something that um, will show in every commercial. So for consumer products, you'll notice that 
almost always in a television commercial, they'll show the packaging at least once, sometimes twice, because they want us to be able to recognize the packaging at the point of purchase. So very important to have um, brand recognition, but also be able to recognize um, the packaging. So consumers were very upset when they changed yeah. the packaging because it stripped away the equity that they had in that design, that look and feel. And I remember myself the first time I saw it, and I was in the store, and I was looking, and I'm looking, and I said, what, they don't have Tropicana? And I bought the one I thought it was the store brand, right, because I just ran in there to get orange juice. And I figured, oh, whatever, I'm just going to get this. Well, I mean, this is ridiculous. So I'm, how much time could I spend here? And I was double parked. So I said, I'll just get this. And then I, when I got home, I looked and said, what? <laughs> this, it had such a different um, look to it and something that the customers had become accustomed to and comfortable with, which is important. Just like... Um, when they changed the logo for Gap. Do you remember that? You know that the, um, historically, the Gap logo looks something like this, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, they changed it, and then I remember with students, um, they were debating with me whether or not this logo was better or the new one was better, but the thing is that the customer was unhappy with the fact that the company changed the logo. Because this was something that was familiar to them. And importantly, with this particular logo, there were strong, unique, and favorable brand associations that they made connections with this logo and the brand name. And for them, it was something that was very favorable. So it doesn't mean that you can't ever change your logo. Yes, you can, but you have to understand the expectations of your customer. Because remember, I told you, the easy part, so to speak, is to determine a brand name and create a logo. But to create associations with your brand name takes a long time and usually takes millions and even billions of dollars to be able to achieve. <coughs> yeah, Joseph. Um, why, would, why would anyone change their logo then if people already had a positive association with it and wouldn't want to see it change? A company will um, reposition themselves. They want to reposition themselves so that they stay relevant to their target market. So sometimes you have um, positive associations, but then sometimes you might have other associations with your brand and it might be something like, for example, that your brand is perceived as outdated or no longer relevant to the target market um, or it's not contemporary or state-of-the-art and so they want to change the perception that the customers have or the potential customers. So one of the things they might do is to change the logo to maybe make it look a little bit more contemporary and something that uh, maybe a younger generation can connect with. But it's not just changing the logo, you're going to change your entire um, marketing campaign as well. So, but if your logo um, is... Um, yeah, so you've got to ask yourself why you would do that is, is a good question. Um, is the level of brand awareness declining? Is the level of um, brand attitude right, declining? Is there some metrics? Are we losing market share? So there's got to be some reason. Um, I'm not sure if we would say if it ain't broke, don't fix it, because I like to think that we're con you know, committed to continuous improvement. But yeah, you have to have a reason it's for doing it. Broke. It's not that it's broken. Right. It's that you're just improving on what, what is there. Yeah. So remember we talked about, um, did we talk about brands and said that when we look to create a brand identity, that it needs to be memorable, protectable, adaptable, and transferable? No? Okay, we will know. Those are four criteria. So when we develop the logo, right, when we, when we um, come up with a brand name, 
when we develop a tagline and a slogan and packaging, those are four criteria that we need to use to evaluate the branding elements. Yeah, Joseph. Um, when it will, before they do any of that stuff, will they use, will they do like, they'll do testing on people, no? They'll actually bring in like- Testing like, on people? do random people, but they'll be like, <laughs> no, like how how's this shows. logo- You can't do testing on people. <laughs> no, but like- um, Unless it's a trial in the pharmaceutical industry. No, shows. like- uh, Control. That'd be funny. Yeah. Control. Yeah, you do, but of course you want to do market the research. With this new logo, how about this? How does that? Absolutely. We want to test. Remember, we said to um, identify the unmet need, we're going to test concepts. Absolutely. We do copy testing for advertising, or at least we should. I mean, some of the things that you see out there, you kind of wonder like, really? You showed this to you know, your target audience, and that's, they said this resonates with them? Like, it's compelling? 180. No. Out of the 180 tests that you've done with 180 different groups of people, this is the best thing that you can get out of it. <laughs> right, right, exactly. But, um, yeah, sometimes what we consider to be a commercial that's, let's say, um, for example, annoying, is not really, but in the industry, what we would consider to be bad. Because sometimes an annoying commercial, it's, 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 it's something that, um, maybe there's a, a jingle or something that, um, you can't get out of your head or something that you talk about, you know, it's so annoying that you tell everybody that you know. Well, yeah, if, you, if you're able to create that buzz, um, then that's very compelling. So a commercial doesn't need to be likable. Giving the finger at the Super Bowl. That's, um, some people, um, yeah, try to do that <laughs> to get attention. And also, we don't need to use, when we think about the approach of our advertising, how we're going to execute it. It doesn't need to be funny. So humor is only one approach that we could use. The commercial doesn't need to be funny. But even if it sticks in your head like an, an annoying commercial, that, that's a good thing. Because it's sticking in your head bad as an annoying commercial, not as a good commercial. So, but the, so the trade-off is that because it's uh, annoying that you talk about it with other people and you're talking about the brand, and so you're creating brand awareness by doing that? Right? Well, it's, but you're talking about the fact that the commercial is annoying, but that doesn't mean that the product is bad. Right? It's just like, oh, you know, that commercial, I mean, it's just like so annoying, and every time I hear it, but every time you hear it, what happens? Do you turn the channel or you, do you watch it? And then you talk about it with other people. Now, if you were saying that the product was... Um, that that meant the product was bad, then that would be um, an associate. That would be a bad association. That they then made the leap and said, "Well, the commercial is annoying. That means that the product must be of a low performance and low quality." Yeah, that would be um, concerning. Some people even argue that um, even bad publicity is good publicity. You know, they say there's no such thing as bad publicity, which is somewhat de debatable. Um, I struggle with that sometimes. Because um, depends what type of bad publicity. If you're getting sued for a faulty product, then yeah, that's yeah. bad publicity. But if yeah. you're getting, if you're, if you're getting, uh, if you're getting bad publicity for like, for instance, the the person, uh, the singer at the halftime, at the halftime, at the halftime show giving the finger, considering that she has an album release in two weeks, yeah, that's bad publicity. But that's bad publicity in a good way that everyone's talking about it, so people are going to say, oh, her album's out. Let's go see what she has to say. What. Yeah, like that. right, absolutely. So it depends on um, what the, the focus of the publicity is. Now remember, you know the difference between advertising and publicity. What's the difference between advertising and publicity? What's the main difference that we should be concerned about? Yeah, one is actually trying to uh, engage uh, targeting, like trying to engage people, and the other one is just, it's just uh, making a statement. It seems, I mean, it's funny and bad, but I'm saying like, like, uh, let's say, this is like a main difference in like PR and advertising, right? Like one is actually engaging people and trying to get them involved in your brand, and the other one is just making a statement. Well, it could have the same um, impact, but go ahead. Let, let's see if you could um, enhance um, what we are. Is it one of them that you do it, and the other one is other people may do it? Advertising, you're putting advertisements out there, you're marketing a product to a certain category, a certain sub-market, and publicity is like, it could be paparazzi, it just happens, and it comes about. Yeah, so, so all of those, what you guys are saying, are good points. So um, to recap, advertising is 
um, a message that we create and we have control over. Publicity is a message that we don't create and we don't have control over. So in an ad, in a TV commercial, for example, we have control over what's said in the ad. With publicity, the concerning, the thing that concerns us is that we have no control over what's going to be said. So even if they interview you and they say, well, we're going to write um, an article and so forth, or we're going to have a, a spot or a segment in our newscast, you have no control over what they're going to say. Publicity is <clears throat> considered to be free, and um, advertising is something that we have to pay for. Now, we could try to create publicity very often. That's what you're suggesting. When you do things like that, that are going to draw attention to yourself, that's why there's a lot of discussion about um, some of the things that are going on with celebrities. They're like, was that you know something that was fabricated? Um, is that was that real? Was it some kind of stunt or something to get publicity? But um, yeah, so we got we have to be sensitive to that. So sometimes it could work to our advantage, and sometimes not, especially if we're working with um, celebrities. What's one of the issues in working with a celebrity? What's one of the concerns? Some people like them, some people don't. So it could be very polarizing. So some people might not like that um, celebrity. And Prince, they try to use celebrities too, right, as part of their approach. What else, Max? Uh, they can do something stupid off the field, like Tiger Woods. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, so... Not one thing. Yeah, just multiple things. Just multiple, yeah. multiple things. Yeah. So, exactly. So if you have a celebrity spokesperson, if you're using athletes, for example, that's great that they're um, a performance athlete, but what about if they're um, arrested for driving while intoxicated? What if they um, beat up their wife, et cetera, et cetera? Then our concern is that that's going to have a negative impact on our brand. Uh, I mean, what if they don't fit the role? It's not believable that they're in the commercial. Yeah, it could be. They're definitely, um, there could be a disconnect. Absolutely. So we want to pick somebody that's going to be relevant. Good, David. I think it's also sometimes they're overused. Like if, especially with major brands, like this whole like uh, new concept, like the sheets. Have you seen the sheets energy strip? I don't think so. Well, I guess whatever they, they made it like this major launch campaign with like an overdose of celebrities. People don't realize like if you don't like utilize each celebrity, like you can't just overflow with celebrities when it comes to like marketing. I mean, yeah, I mean it could. Um, it could be confusing. Um, yeah, there definitely needs to See, be some, some focus. Each celebrity has different market segments that they deal with. No, that's smart. It's no, smart. it's not when you're dealing with a product that's only dealing with millennials. It's overloading. With like, it's overloading. Yeah, you can't overload. Overload. But isn't it for energy strips like towards sports? Yeah, what's different? the target market for energy strips towards sports? People who play sports. Yeah, forty old guy is like you're gonna die in the energy anyway, regardless of what it takes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I better go take my vitamins. Go ahead. <laughs> when you uh, hire celebrities, you also when you're advertising, you want to advertise. You don't want to base your advertising off their off publicity and by using, by using public figures as as uh, for advertisements. You're, basing your entire advertisement off of publicity. It's a little bit of marrying the two together, which you don't want, you want to be saying, we're advertising this product, and we're, instead of saying, we're using the publicity of this person to advertise the product. Yeah, some companies try to, um, they think that publicity is all that they need to create buzz um, and engage in viral marketing, but... Publicity only lasts so long. Yeah, what we're trying to do is to have a long-term build to formulating a relationship with our target market and target audience to be able to engage them, and that's only something that could happen over time. Um, it's difficult to be able to sustain publicity for a, for a given company over an extended period of time because basically you're like sort of... You're you're creating you're publicity. Feeding, you're feeding off the publicity. Of the right. Well, you're also you're creating the events that lead to the publicity, and is that less expensive than advertising? 
Yeah, in some ways it, it could be, um, depending on the situation or where would we be advertising. But um, it becomes um, challenging to execute that over a long period of time. So it's something that, um, that we need to consider carefully. And remember, importantly, is that we have no control over what the publicity is going to say. So we create, we try to create publicity, we try to do things that are newsworthy to get this so-called free advertising, and then we're at the mercy of the reporters or newscasters as to what they're going to say. They might give it a positive spin, they might give it a negative spin, and then is it going to be something that's relevant to our brand and to our product line? But they might not give it a spin at all, and then it's going to be a good time. Absolutely. So we're not the only ones that are out there that are trying to get publicity. They understand that. They understand when they do an editorial or a segment for a particular product or brand. They know what publicity is. All right, so good discussion. Let's talk now about um, where we left off. We'll just briefly talk about the difference between durable products and non-durable products. What did we say is another term for non-durable products? Consumable. consumable. So what's the difference between consumable and durable products? So I think I heard it. Go ahead. Like car and you reuse a durable product and non So an example I think I'm hearing you say that a durable product for it would be an example a car which has multiple um, uses, right? Well, that we could use multiple times over and over again that we don't use up. Now it could wear out. We could wear out our car or our computer, but it's not something that we consume. So food would be a good example of a consumable product because it's something that we use a few times and we use it up and we have to buy more, we have to replenish. Like orange juice. Right? So you buy orange juice and you drink it and when it's done, it's done. It didn't wear out. We consumed it. So it's a consumable. So we used it up and then we buy more. So it's important to understand that because that's going to have an impact on our marketing strategy. So it's different when we're marketing a product that people buy every week versus a product that people buy every year or every five years. Would sneakers be more of a durable or, or endurable? Well, what do you think? Would you sneakers something that's durable or consumable? Consumable. Durable. 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 It seems durable. to me it's more consumable because either durable. way, as far as the kids are concerned, you have to, your feet are always growing. So you have to get a new one every six to eight months, whatever. But, yeah, but as far as adults, they wear out. I have the same it's durable it's more. Durable. I think it's it more durable. A long time. You, you use it all something. You use it a lot. You, 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 you use it every day. day. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, a, a different products are going to have a different lifespan. So um, your car might last 10 years. Your sneakers might last 10 months. But that doesn't mean it's, um, not durable. Okay. There's no, there's no time. Like, there's cut off. Type, type of You're paying the price. Also, a car is like tw at least twenty thousand dollars, and shoes are. No, um, <laughs> time is not um, like one of the key determinants. The the key distinguishing factor between durable and non-durable is that non-durable is something that you actually consume, that you use up, which is different from either you're wearing it out or you're outgrowing it. So that doesn't change the fact that the product is durable because um, your child's feet have grown. It's still a, a durable product. It's still a product that you could use again and again and again without using it up. You're not using it up, but it may be wear out or you then might you outgrow it. And then you buy another one. Well, ultimately, um, you see, the, the issue with durable products is 
What we want to do as marketers is shorten the time between the initial purchase and repeat pur purchase, right? So with consumable goods, the period of time for a repeat purchase is usually very short. Could be like you're buying orange juice every week versus with a durable product, it could be every year or every 10 years. But although that's something we need to take into account, the key distinction is that one, you are consuming and using up and then need to replenish, and the other you could use um, again and again without using it up. But you're right, I mean, you might outgrow those sneakers or um, it, they might eventually wear out. Um, durable, within this context, does not mean indestructible. It's durable, uh, but it could still break or wear out over time. Are services not durable? Okay, so what do you think about um, service? Because um, when we talk about products in this context, we're using the term very um, broadly. So products would include durable and non-durable. And what did we say last time? Go ahead. I was going to say, as far as services, I think they're more durable because you could use them numerous times. If you have a warranty on a product, you could use it more than once. Not so do you remember last time we made a distinction? We said these are goods, and then we have services. So when we talk about products, we're going to use a general um, classification, the term products. And products consist of goods, which could be durable or non-durable. <laughs> I, I Sorry, I have to chuckle about that. Um, Sometimes we use the term consumable. And then also services. So two different classifications of products. All right. Let's see. We still have a little bit of time. Hmm. All right. Next time we're going to talk about branding and product life cycle. But don't move. And um, we'll talk about introduction, growth, maturity, decline obsolescence and revitalization, which are the key stages of the product life cycle, which is very important. But let's touch upon these. Um, convenience products, shopping products, specialty products, and unsought products. The reason why it's important to make this distinction, and the reason why it's important to make a distinction between durable and non-durable, is because that's going to influence our marketing strategy and tactics. So we need to classify the goods. We need to understand that because that's going to define our strategy. So what would be an example of a convenience product? Food, orange juice. Right. Anything. So convenience products are ones yeah. that... Uh, Accessible. Right, easily yeah. accessible um, products that we buy frequently. So it could be, like you said, it could be juice, it could be uh, types of food. Um, we'll call it convenience products, but usually in the uh, like supermarkets they tend to put them in the, hole in the back corner and make you walk through the whole store in order to get to them. That's the people need them more often, so when they walk in, they make them walk all the way through and check out the other products while they fall down the way. Right, so that's a very good point. In retail, um, we're very focused, like you guys started to um, address the issue of product placement, whether it's in the back of the store or the front of the store, and also in retail we look at what's called adjacencies. Adjacencies are what's on the shelf next to our product, what's on the shelf below our product, on the other side of the aisle, what products are there? Are, they, are there complementary products or substitute products? So do you put the tea kettles next to the tea bags? And do you have dual placement? Do you have tea bags in the aisle with coffee, but then have a second section where you have cookware type items, pots, pans, and tea kettles, and put tea bags there? And do you also put honey next to that? So very important um, in retail. And what about shopping products? What's the difference? Pretty much it's almost the opposite of convenience product. 
um, something that um, we buy le much less frequently and something that we spend a lot of time generally researching before we make a purchase. So another way that we could look at this is say that convenience products are usually low involvement products and shopping products are generally um, high involvement. So there are two different um, models, if you will, two different ways to, to look at the purchase dynamic, but I think it's applicable here to kind of make that leap. How would you classify something that people buy in bulk? Although it's like a convenience product that they buy, that they need frequently, or they use it frequently, but yet they buy it in bulk, like paper, towels, or cups, or something like that. It's not so much convenience, because I mean, although they're using it every day, they're not buying, they're only buying it uh, once a month or once every other month because they, when they do buy it, they buy it in, in bulk. Oh yeah, that's something that um, we need to be aware of is, and it's called overstocking the trade, but also overstocking um, the customer or the consumer. Because what happens is, when we do that, if we sell it, that means we need to understand, or we're selling um, buy one, get one free. What happens is people stock up, right? And so we're gonna see a spike in sales for that period, and then what happens the next month? Well, everybody's, they got all, they got like a year's worth of uh, honey or tea bags or cereal or whatever it is already. What well, next month they're not gonna buy. And so would that be some sort of hybrid here between, well, it's a convenience product, but maybe um, even though it's low involvement, but we don't buy it very often now. I think it's, um, that's going to um, not change whether or not how we classify the product, but how we classify you as the shopper. You see, so I would still say that um, in general, that product would still either be convenience or shopping, but your behavior, and that's a, fo another, a different focus, is specifically consumer behavior is what's going to change. I wouldn't say that that would change the classification of the product. What do you guys think? You think that the um, that paper towels are still a convenience product, even though you might buy it in bulk? I mean, it's still a product that usually you buy regularly and is a low involvement purchase. Yes, I would say that it's, a, it's two different issues, is how you classify the product, and the other is how we classify your behavior. So whether or not you're buying um, whether or not it's a planned purchase or an impulse purchase or you're buying in bulk like you suggested. All right, so you guys ready to go? Fabulous. All right, have a good night. We'll do this again soon.